Christ to be a beacon of truth and instead joined in support of bloodshed, it's impossible to pursue the Great Commission at the end of a barrel, boot, or bomb. How quickly we attempt to cast God from His throne and proclaim sentence on whomever we choose. It was no slip of the tongue by the former president when he used the word crusade while persuading the majority of American Christians to embrace the current war. He, he proclaims to be a Christian. And those within the church supported him enthusiastically at the time because of his public profession of Christ. Yet we are warned in the Bible to judge a tree by its fruit, and rather than judging the substance of fruits, the church has once again trusted in false idols rather than God. As a result of our disobedience and distrust in God, we have entrusted the Godverment to fulfill our will on earth by instituting such an ungodly thing as the war on poverty, the war on drugs, the war on unwanted babies, the war on terror, and the war on your neighbor to the use of eminent domain. America has imprisoned more people. America has imprisoned more people both in percentages of population and sheer numbers than any other nation on earth. The Chinese have a saying, show me a nation of many laws and I will show you a lawless nation. In the immortal words of Merle Haggard, where's all the freedom we've been a fighting for? <laughs> Regardless of every good intention, quote, what we are describing as America's war against God, that's what we are describing, is that war against God, unjustly depriving anyone of their God-given right to life, liberty, or property is murder. Mercy will not be found in the day of judgment by those who hide behind the facade of state-sanctioned murder. The incontrovertible evidence of that truth was made abundantly clear during the Nuremberg trials after World War II. And this nation has been at war with God for a long time. And as God promises in His Word, we are reaping the harvest from the seeds we have sown, all in the name of a false morality based on collectivism that produces nothing but devastation and a false sense of security pursued with the bayonet that has made this nation a nation of slaves. So why do we engage in unjustified war? And who benefits from it? Since God is not the author of evil, the fault, it always lies in our own sinful nature. The question of who benefits from war can be ascertained by listening to what combat veterans have said in the past. First, there is the off-quoted phrase from General Smedley Butler in which he says, war is a racket. That short phrase speaks volumes about the nature of warfare and points to its beneficiaries. This from a man ultimately familiar with war. The next comes in the form of a presidential speeches made to the American people during the consecutive administrations of former General Dwight D. Eisenhower and Lieutenant John F. Kennedy. The speeches were made concerning the threats to American liberty as a consequence of allowing the military-industrial complex to control the political dialectic. Severe Clear is a documentary made of the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq in 2003 filmed and narrated by retired Marine Corps Captain Mike Saudi. In the beginning of the film, Captain Saudi is brutally honest about his fellow Marines' motivation for fighting, revenge for the 9-11 attacks. That is the subliminal message that is given a wink and a nod by most everyone. Yet, if you take at face value the official conspiracy, the powers that be have rammed down the throat of America, then it, and then it was Saudi's and not Iraqis that supposedly carried out the 9-11 attacks. But the whitewashed version of what we are doing in the Middle East, given by the corporate media and military harlots for the benefit of the self-righteous, is given the dubious title of Operation Iraqi Freedom. We are giving Iraqis freedom whether they like it or not, and the order of the day is submit or be shot. How is it that normally rational people engage in hysterical, historical revisionism? The answer is that we have become a nation that embraces this culture of death. When the Marines arrived in southern Iraq in 2003, the commander of Lieutenant Saudi's company made it clear during his rules of engagement speech that the Iraqi people wanted to be liberated by America and that they were not the enemy. The latter part of that statement is unusually accurate given the source. 
The Iraqi people are not our enemies, but they are a convenient enemy for those that feed their war machine with the bodies of innocents. Towards the end of the film, Captain Saudi's enthusiasm for revenge had turned to bitter disillusionment after seeing his fellow Marines killed and maimed for what he now understood as a pointless exercise in futility. His resentment for politicians and military hubris was well honed. Arriving back in America further fortified his disillusionment with the war and those responsible for prosecuting it. Sadly, he adds in the same breath that he would go back again, not for the politicians, not for the generals or even America, I'd go back because of my buddies. Another travesty of unjustified war is leaving warriors without a place of rest. So it will follow with them the rest of their lives. Uh, it's easy enough to say it was worth it when you didn't have to pay any admission to the play. Uh, the Romans were probably not the first to use a strategy of divide and conquer but they most certainly perfected it in conquering most of the known world in a reign of terror, lasting the better part of a millennia. That legacy of divide and conquer has been passed on to every succeeding empire, including our own. It's a pernicious idea that eventually invades the very fabric of society and ultimately destroys its host. I have the opinion that God has used this very phenomenon since before the building of the Tower of Babylon to bring to dust every vain imagination of man that exalts itself before the throne of Almighty God. Imperialism is bad enough, but it is even worse when it is done in the name of Christianity. Yeah. And finishing up Paul's speech here, uh, so we are able to allow um, others to speak, especially uh, Mr. Will Grigg has some things for us today. Um, America is self-absorbed and infatuated with herself. She has fully embraced irrational thought, irrational hedonism, and short-sighted self-love dominate this society. Rather than the responsible and rational, God-centered individualism of the Founding Fathers, America has equated corporatism and its false prosperity with individual success. She has equated the pursuit of lust with the idea of liberty. Instead of finding ultimate satisfaction and pleasure in the glory of God through beautiful ideas, the culture reeks of self-idolization and will worship. She insists on forging her own path instead of looking to God from whom her help comes. She claims to be a bastion of freedom even while she imprisons and murders more people than any other country in the world. She has reached the pinnacle of civilization only to succumb to the barbarism of collectivism. Pride is relished as a virtue rather than scorn to vice. She calls evil good and good evil. In short, she has traded her birthright for a mess of pottage. The result is that she has repeated every mistake of the preceding 21 civilizations. The solution, as in any age, with regards to an individual or nation, is repentance. I would call on the church at large to establish a day of repentance for all our grievous sins. Such a statement of faith would require us both individually and as an, and a nation, to cast our foolish pride at the foot of the cross and beg for mercy. Thank you, Dan. Next is Will Gregg. Will is a blogger. Uh, he runs the Pro Libertate blog, and he's a frequent contributor to LouRockwell.com. He's the former senior editor for the New American Magazine and the author of Liberty in, Ecl in Eclipse, The War on Terror and the Rise of the Homeland Security State. Will. Thank you. Thanks, AJ. As we were reminded yesterday, to such devastating effect, there is nothing worse than the violent death of a child. Two days ago, nobody but his family and close friends had heard the name of Adam Lanza. He has now gained global notoriety in the worst possible way as a murderer of children. The slaughter of 26 innocent people, 20 of them children, left a nation of 300 million people stunned and horrified. How can we be protected from people like this, wondered a resident of Newtown, Connecticut, at a prayer service last night. You take precautions, but how can you see this coming? 
I can't imagine what the parents are going through. Now, sentiments of that kind are entirely understandable, notwithstanding the fact that the massacre at Sandy Hook Elementary School was a horrifying aberration. Now imagine being the resident of a country a little more than half our size, where this kind of massacre occurs at least once a week. A country where it has become commonplace for innocent people to be murdered without warning by unmanned drones that dispense death from the skies. Those killing machines are the property of a distant and prohibitively stronger foreign power. They're operated by joystick-wielding functionaries who are safely ensconced in climate-controlled offices in Nevada, Virginia, and New York. No defense is available against the drone attacks, and no retaliation is possible against the people who control the drones. Many parents of the targeted country have decided to protect their children the only way they can by refusing to send them to school, to the market, or to worship services. They and their families are effectively prisoners in their own homes and neighborhoods. And that really doesn't provide much protection either, because every dwelling is a potential target for a drone attack. This is the situation today in Pakistan, one of the half dozen or more countries against which the government that impudently rules us is waging war. Pakistan has never harmed or threatened us in any way, but that's precisely the kind of target that the government in Washington prefers. A study recently published by the NYU School of Law and Stanford University Law School describes what it is like for Pakistanis who are living under drones. Drones hover 24 hours a day over communities in northwest Pakistan, striking homes, vehicles, and public spaces without warning. Their presence terrorizes men, women, and children. The U.S. practice of striking one area multiple times and evidence that it has killed rescuers makes both community members and humanitarian workers afraid or unwilling to assist injured victims. Some parents choose to keep their children home and children injured or traumatized by strikes have dropped out of school. Out of the thousands of Pakistanis killed by drone strikes conducted during the first Obama term, less than 2% involve so-called high-level targets. That figure is even more remarkable in light of the infinitely elastic definitions used to designate so-called militants. Last May, the New York Times reported, citing confidential administration sources, that Obama had approved a policy of counting all military-aged males in a targeted area as militants. Now, this is a murderous variation on the logical error sometimes called the Texas sharpshooter fallacy. Some of you might have heard of this. That's essentially the practice of a gunman firing a shot and then a bullseye is drawn, is drawn, is drawn around whatever it happens to hit. That way he never misses. Now, how are drone targets selected? Under Obama, the CIA and the Pentagon have adopted a practice called pattern of life analysis, in which neighborhoods are ranked as potential targets based on com computer analysis of the daily habits and associations of those who reside therein. How do Pakistanis, on the receiving end of this unremitting campaign of state terrorism, see Americans? Would it be unreasonable for them to look upon us the way we look upon Adam Lanza? Although Obama, the Nobel Peace Laureate, presides over this campaign of state terrorism, it didn't begin with him. In preparation for the invasion of Iraq in 2003, the Pentagon's war planners devised a computer modeling program called bug splat to estimate the percentage of civilian casualties that would result in a given bombing raid. Just before the shock and awe assault on Baghdad began, General Tommy Franks was informed of 22 proposed bombing attacks that would result in what was described as heavy bug splat. He approved all 22 raids. The term bug splat has become commonplace among drone operators. The same lexicon of long distance murder has been expanded to include another newly minted term to describe the terrified civilians who can be seen frantically running for cover. Squirters. This vaguely pornographic over, the vaguely pornographic order overtones of that expression are appropriate given the ubiquity of what Dr. P.W. Singer of the Brookings Institution calls predator porn. That's footage of drone attacks that's proudly circulated by the purported heroes responsible for the carnage. 
In a 2009 U.S. Naval Academy lecture, Singer described how the ability to download a video clip of combat is turning war into a form of entertainment. This repellent new genre includes a modern variety of snuff film. A Hellfire missile drops, goes in, and hits the target, followed by an explosion, and bodies are tossed into the air. Dr. Singer describes one clip of that kind sent to him by a joystick-wielding assassin that was set to music the pop song I Just Want to Fly by the band Sugar Ray. Singer recalls asking a drone pilot, what is it like to fight insurgents in Iraq while based in Nevada? He said, you were going to war for 12 hours, shooting weapons at targets, directing kills on enemy combatants, and then you get into a car and you drive home, and within 20 minutes you're sitting at a dinner table talking to your kids about their homework. Meanwhile, somewhere in Iraq, or Afghanistan, or Pakistan, or Libya, or Somalia, or Yemen, or Syria, or heaven only knows what other countries, families are picking through the rubble of their homes in the rapidly evaporating hope that their own children have somehow survived this most recent act of imperial generosity. As an intelligence analyst stationed in Iraq, Army Private Bradley Manning, a soldier who honored his oath, was immersed in the steady stream of bug splat videos. At times, it felt like watching nonstop snuff films, observed a New York Magazine profile of this prisoner of conscience. An intel analyst sat at his workstation and targeted